Hello everyone uh, from all over the world. My name is Kirsty Bashforth. I am the Chief People and Communications Officer here at Diavaram, and I'm delighted to be talking to you from the UK today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first in a series of Diavaram webinars this year dedicated to helping renal patients live well with kidney disease. It all starts today, 11th of March, on World Kidney Day. World Kidney Day is a global campaign aimed at raising awareness of the importance of kidneys to our overall health. A noble cause, after all, kidneys are vital organs in the human body, and an astonishing about 10% of the world's population suffer from some sort of kidney disease, with an alarming percentage of those not even knowing it. We at Diavarum are strong believers of this year's theme of living well with kidney disease and have therefore partnered with the World Kidney Day organizers to amplify the conversation around kidney health and reduce the impact of such disease on our communities. At Diavarum, we are no strangers to this ambition. Our purpose as an organization is to enhance the lives of renal patients, helping them live fulfilling lives. So it is beyond renal care, it is about empowering patients to live well with their condition. Today's webinar, our first one, will focus on a very pressing topic, kidney disease and the COVID-19 vaccine. With the pandemic still impacting communities around the world and renal patients at greater risk of becoming seriously unwell from COVID-19, vaccines are key to safeguarding the health of renal patients and in fact, to ending this pandemic for all of us. As we highlight the importance of vaccination, questions concerning the vaccines naturally start among renal patients, their families and communities. Is it safe for patients on dialysis? Can a patient with a kidney transplant get the vaccine? How do the vaccines work? To answer these questions, we are joined uh, by Dr. Fernando Macario, our foremost expert on kidney health, nephrologist, transplantologist expert, and our very own Diavarum Chief Medical Officer. You might have seen him previously in our social media, and today he is here for you in person. Before we hand over to Dr. Fernando, our host for today's webinar, Michaela Blomstrand, Director, Global Patient Experience here at Diavarum, and former nurse in one of our clinics, will walk you through basic housekeeping rules and how the event will work. So over to you, Michaela, from the UK over to Sweden. Thank you, Kirsty. And as your host through uh, today's session, please allow me to just quickly run you through some short housekeeping rules to make this a pleasant event for everyone. Uh, starting with this webinar is planned for a maximum of 60 minutes and all attendees microphone are off to ensure a high quality event. In addition to the questions that Dr. Macario will cover in his presentation, the Q&A functionality is open throughout the event. So please submit your questions at any time. And while we are very happy to answer all of your questions, we won't be able to answer questions regarding specific medical cases and refers those to your doctor. Your question will be visible only to you and our medical team. And we will try to answer as many questions as possible. So over to you, Dr. Macario, from Sweden to Portugal. Thank you, Michaela. And I will scare. Uh, I will. I will share the presentation again, if you mind. Just give me thirty seconds, and we will start in a minute. Good evening to everybody. It is for me a pleasure to be here with you, even if in a virtual way to discuss some aspects about COVID-19 vaccination in kidney patients, particularly in dialysis patients. Please let me also thank Dr. Matthias Arauz. 
He is the head of science and development in, in, in Daivero, and he supported me on the scientific way in this, for this presentation. If you remember, it was exactly one year ago that COVID-19 was declared by the World Health Organization as a pandemic disease. Most probably, COVID-19 will be the biggest and most important event of our century. Many aspects of our life will be different after this catastrophe. They are different now already. The impact on people, on families, in our society is almost impossible to measure. In many of the aspects that we consider the foundations of humanity, society is different. It will be different. Our kids and youth, they are growing in a such a different way. Health indicators will be heavily impacted after this. Economy will struggle to recover and it will take many years to return to normal, if ever. But mankind is extremely capable of adaptation and for sure, many good things will emerge. In Daivero, we are proud of the resilience and capability to organize our strong response by our teams, both in offices and in our clinics. I am sure we will emerge stronger than ever from this pandemic. I will talk firstly about COVID-19 pandemic current situation worldwide, and then I will focus on vaccination and its relevance for chronic kidney disease patients. Contingency measures like physical distancing, correct wearing of masks, frequent and hygiene are what keep us safe and can prevent us from contracting, contracting COVID-19. Vaccination, on the other hand, is what will make us achieve the so-called earth immunity or community immunity in order to end the pandemic situation. For this to be achieved, we need a worldwide rollout of vaccination. This is a global responsibility from each one of us and from our decision makers and politicians. There will be no success ending the pandemic if wealthier countries do not support poor regions of the globe. I will now drive, drive you briefly on some concrete aspects of the COVID-19 disease, the magnitude of the pandemic, and also our strategy to fight the pandemic. As you well know, this new virus called SARS coronavirus 2 is a novel coronavirus that was identified in China after a cluster of cases of viral pneumonia in Wuhan by the end of 2019. We call COVID-19 to the disease caused by this virus. As I told you, it was declared a pandemic exactly one year ago, March 11, 2020. This virus spreads mostly from person to person, despite the possibility of animal to human transmission. And the transmission can occur directly or indirectly through contaminated surfaces in a much lower extent. Some infected people never develop symptoms, but they can transmit the virus. And on those that develop the illness, it can vary from mild disease to severe disease or even to death. We have now more than 818 million cases worldwide and more than 2.6 million deaths reported. If you see the left hand picture, you can see that the globe is still painted dark, meaning high incidence of new cases. And where it is not dark, probably we are missing data, like in many countries in Africa and some places. This means that the disease has been reported already in 1.5% of the global population. But probably, or certainly, the real number of cases is somewhere between 15 to 20 times more. Back in October, if you remember, 
the World Health Organization estimated that 10% of the population worldwide may have had the virus. This was October, when there were slightly more than 37 million cases reported. So if you compare this with today's numbers, you just have to make the calculations. If you look to the right-hand side graphs, you can see in the upper graph, the number of daily new cases that decreased from the first to seven week of this year, but it increased, it increased last, last week. Number of daily deaths, deaths in the bottom graph looks to be decreasing during last, last week. Let's see how it goes. Here you can see in this uh, slide, the evolution of the current situation in general population in the countries where our company takes care of CKD patients. We believe that to follow community numbers is the best way to understand the risk for our patients and staff. We cannot avoid that our patients and staff contract the disease in their daily lives. We are all at risk. Nevertheless, nevertheless we can avoid outbreaks in our clinics. In these two graphs you have on the left one, the seven day rolling, the cumulative number of cases and on the right one, the seven day rolling average of the new cases per million people. And you can see in the left that in terms of cumulative cases per million people, so that we can compare the, the numbers, the most affected countries so far are Portugal, Lithuania, Sweden, Spain, UK, France. Once again, I'm telling you, these are the countries where we operate. On the right hand side, it is quite clear that after a decrease in most countries, some are now increasing again the number of daily new cases. So it is a quite complex situation uh, for analysis. We do this continuously in a daily base. If you talk about deaths, because this is a disease where the death toll is significant. In these two graphs, you can see cumulative again and daily new deaths. In the left hand side graph, the highest cumulative death toll is still UK, Italy, Hungary, Portugal, North Macedonia, Spain, and France, of the countries where we operate. In the right hand side graph, daily death evolution. The current situation is now worse in Hungary, Brazil, Poland, and Spain, and it improved a lot in UK and in, in, in Portugal. Situation change over time. So with this, I think we can say that we cannot rest. It is clear from the national numbers that situations. We are having still 350 to 500,000 cases per day and 7.5 to 10,000 deaths per day after peaks end of last year of 850,000 cases and 17,500 cases deaths per day. This means that COVID-19 is responsible for close to 10% of all deaths worldwide. There is almost no single region of the globe spared, and some regions are still in a complicated situation with high transmission rates and high mortality. Vaccination, vaccination started already in many countries at different paces. We also know that new variants emerged. This is expected in such a kind of, of a virus. We are still trying to fully understand its impact, and I will develop a little more on, on this aspect. It is important to understand the meaning of the new variants that are becoming prevalent. Of the new variants, two of the most significant are UK variant and South African variant. But we also have new variants in Brazil, New York, the Brazilian variant from Manaus, New York variant, and now the Californian variant. It looks that these variants have increased transmissibility and contagiousness. It is not clear if they are more aggressive. We need more studies to understand the response to the different vaccines. At least the South African variant, it looks 
that some vaccines can be less effective. In fact, it seems that the current vaccines can recognize the new variants, but eventually they don't provide, or some of them don't provide as much protection against them. For instance, so just an example, Moderna neutralizing antibodies dropped sixfold with the South African variant. But there are many studies underway to see if boost doses or even mix of different vaccines can increase effectiveness. And also we know that there are studies underway and that vaccines can be adapted to new variants, like for instance, it happens with, with the, the influenza vaccine. In this chart, that has a lot of information, but I will synthesize some of this information. We can see preliminary studies and information about the efficacy of vaccines against the new variants. There, is, there are still many questions open, a lot of research going on. If we can draw any first answers, we can say that some vaccines are less effective against new variants, but they still confer some significant protection. And it's also very interesting to see that first conclusions of uh, mass vaccination rollout in a few countries, like for instance, in Israel, they demonstrate that vaccines are extremely effective in real world, in the population, avoiding severe cases and hospitalizations. And as I said, vaccines can and will be adapted to new variants as influenza vaccines. So this is not the end of the story and this not preclude the efficacy of vaccinations and that we believe in vaccinations. How will COVID-19 look in the future? That's a very interesting question. Will COVID-19 end? Well, I don't believe so. I think it will be among us like an endemic disease like measles, for instance, or like influenza. So we will be able to deal with it. Eventually with the need for periodic vaccination programs, extra care during certain periods, certain seasons, there will be limited outbreaks, but let's be clear. One thing that is important is that large numbers of refusal to vaccination can severely impact on success, like we see in some situations with measles. So refusal of the vaccine cannot be a passively accepted behavior. So hopefully with the achievement of the herd immunity, the pandemic situation will end. We will have an endemic disease that we will know how to deal with it, but the pandemic situation that is paralyzing our societies and our lives will end and we will be able to return to normal life. And the sooner the better. And that can be done as I will show you only with vaccination. There are other extremely important aspects of this disease. Let me refer to one issue that can impact on the fight against the pandemic and can lead to serious mental issues at a global scale and disrupt society, pandemic fatigue. Not to be confused with the post-COVID fatigue that patients that are uh, that sometimes experience after having COVID. No, it's pandemic fatigue. People get tired of the pandemic measures, that's normal. Tend to get somehow immune to the numbers and to become relaxed on measures. And those measures are important as ever. This can lead to abandoning of precautions and increased number of cases. So we must have strategies to deal with this. It is important to take care of people. And even the World Health Organization recommended strategies to deal with pandemic fatigue. Basically is to listen, recognize, understand, engage and support. Those are the basics for this. What about the response to the pandemic in our company and at our clinics and offices? Our priorities are maintain patient and staff safe make vaccination a success and maintain the excellence of care of our patients. Our response 
is based on four pillars that we strive to keep alive during this phase and every single day. Compliance with our contingency plans is absolutely critical. We cannot relax now. The measures of our contingency plan are what keeps staff and CKD patients safe in the clinic environment. Partnering with national healthcare systems is crucial for all that relates with COVID-19 and especially for vaccination. Access to protective equipment to every single person of our staff patients is key to ensure operations continuity. And again, support to our staff is fundamental. So we strive to listen, to recognize, to understand, to engage and to support our staff. Having made the context of uh, the pandemic, we come to what we think will be the turning point, vaccination. In a record time, but in a very rigorous and safe way, several types of vaccines have been developed. They are safe. They are effective. What are the fundamentals of vaccination? Well, basically, vaccines teach our immune system to recognize the virus, to memorize it, and to elicit a response to the virus when in contact with it. So we are able to eliminate the virus mostly through the production of specific antibodies, but also with some additional mechanisms like a different type of immunity, T cell immunity. So for in the end, vaccines allow us to prevent very serious disease. And we have many, many, many examples in the past. This will not be different with COVID-19. Very, very different types of vaccines have been developed. I will try to simplify this. We have currently big, 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 big groups of vaccines against the, the, this new coronavirus. We have two types of genetic vaccines, messenger RNA and DNA vaccines. They use genetic engineered RNA and DNA to code for, to generate a protein that itself will prompt an immune response. Let me tell you that messenger RNA is a genetic model molecule that creates the genetic instruction to produce a coronavirus protein like known as spike, then it will provoke a response from the immune system. We also have inactivated or weakened virus vaccine, which use a form of the virus that is, has been inactivated or weakened, so it doesn't cause disease, but still generates the immune response. Then we have the subunity or protein-based vaccines, which use armless fragments of proteins of, or of protein shell that mimic the virus to safely generate also an immune response. And we have viral vector vaccines which use a safe virus that cannot cause disease but serves as a platform to produce coronavirus proteins that in the end will generate this immune response. I will briefly go to some of the vaccines that we have now. We have actually six vac vaccines approved for full use, six in early or limited use. And uh, probably you heard that today the European regulator, Emma, have, uh, approved the Johnson vaccine. There are many other vaccines that are in earlier stages of research and clinical trials. So we, we will have different types of vaccines. So I will now, now go for some of the most relevant. Starting with the genetic vaccines, we have already in widespread use two messenger RNA vaccines in many countries, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Both need two doses to confer full protection. Both need freezer storage. With the change now in Pfizer vaccine, at the uh, beginning, uh, it was thought that that needed minus 70 degrees. And now we know that is stable between minus 25 and minus 15. So 
quite similar to the others, both confer an high level of protection. 95, 94% is extremely high level of protection. We have some adenovirus type vaccines already in use. They have reported good efficacy and few side effects also. We have the Russian vaccine, the Sputnik V, and the AstraZeneca vaccine. And it's, it's interesting to see that these two companies, Gamaleya and AstraZeneca, joined efforts and started the trial in February to see if a mixture of these two vaccines can increase the eff efficacy of AstraZeneca vaccine. AstraZeneca is working on a new version of the vaccine tailored specifically for the South African vaccine. We have also the Johnson and Johnson Janssen uh, vaccine that only needs one dose. Well, probably you heard the news today, and I will admit to it, that a batch of AstraZeneca vaccine has been suspended in six European countries. Denmark, Austria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, over concerns related with blood clots. The vaccine has been suspended completely in Denmark, but this is a temporary situation and it has to be clarified if there is a link between vaccine and blood clots. So we cannot take any conclusions now. And sometimes there are no links between these two kinds of things. So let's not take any not jump in any conclusion on that. There are currently two inactivated virus type vaccines coming from China. Sinopharm, right from the Beijing Institute of Biologic Products, was approved in China after demonstrating an efficacy of 79%. And in the United Arab Emirates, with a different kind of study, it showed 86% efficacy. So both vaccines from China received approval already in many, uh, in several countries. Always the rollout of vaccines going on. As I told you, it will be extremely important to vaccinate large parts of populations. As you can see from the graphs, cumulative on the left hand side and daily cases, uh, and this is doses per meal per 100 people. It's different from country to countries. In the countries where we operate, the countries that vaccinated more so far in general population are United King, Kingdom and Chile. And then on other countries, you have the examples of uh, Israel with a very high rate of vaccination and also the United States now probably with new administration, is going also quite well. But we have to speed up vaccination everywhere. And the questions, are vaccines safe? It's normal that some people have concerns. But let me tell you now that millions of people received the vaccines we can be positive on that. It's not only the clinical trials, but also the vaccination in population that is showing them, showing us that they are safe. COVID-19 vaccines, they were done in a record time, but they were the most rigorous trials that you can imagine. Dozens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people were enrolled in the clinical trials, much more than in other vaccines before. Side effects are limited and pose no danger as long as strict standards are followed. Serious side effects are extremely rare. So we can be sure that benefits greatly outweigh any eventual risk uh, of the vaccine. The risk of contracting the disease, it's for sure, much greater. Are they effective? What about effectiveness of device vaccines? Well, the trials once again proved efficacy, avoiding serious disease. 
Large-scale population studies in countries where a significant proportion of population is vaccinated, like Israel, clearly show a diminishing of infections of severe disease and consequently of hospitalization also. Despite that, it is important to follow measures that prevent the spreading of the disease. There is a chance that one can spread the virus even if vaccinated. We still have some not answered questions regarding this. Vaccines in general, not only COVID vaccine, have saved millions and millions of lives. COVID-19 vaccine will be no exception. Number of severe cases is dramatically reduced with the vaccination, as we know now, both from clinical trials and real population uh, studies. This will put a stop on the pressure on health systems, because when the incidence of is very high, when there is a stress on health systems, we all saw what happened in many countries, like in Italy, in France, in Spain, UK, in Portugal, in the United States, that mortality increases when there is a stress on hospitals, on health institutions, on ICUs. So immunization is for sure the key to open the society and the economy, something that we all know, what we all want. The solution to end the pandemic is to rapidly achieve the so-called herd or community immunity, when the number of individuals immune to COVID-19 in a community is sufficient to prevent widespread ongoing transmission. The keys for this are strong public health responses, measures so simple as physical distancing, hygiene measures, rapid white testings, better therapeutics that we also need for those that contract disease, and massive vaccination. The, what about dialysis patients? Should they receive the highest priority for COVID-19 vaccination. It's different from country to country. The rules differ from country to country. We know that dialysis patients, they have a high risk of severe outcome. We have proved this in uh, some very well-conducted studies and published studies. They are more, more prone to contract the disease for several reasons. They have a different immune system. They need to commute to dialysis. They have frequent visits to hospitals. Some of our dialysis patients are elderly. Some are institutionalized. And most of them have comorbidities known to be correlated with our prognosis, like hypertension, like diabetes, and like cardiovascular disease. So, We started very early to take maximum measures to protect patients and staff in our company. We issued our first policy January 2020. We published our COVID-19 contingency plan February 2020, and then we adapted as things were evolving, always with the same, protect our patients, protect our staff, we consider now that chronic kidney disease and especially dialysis patients must be prioritized for vaccination. And with that in mind, we promote vaccination of our patients and staff in close cooperation with authorities, even offering our clinics in some countries and staff to vaccinate patients within our clinics. And we adapted, we adapted our contingency plan to follow on vaccination rollout. So we promote safe behavior also. We promote vaccination with objective and evidence-based communication. You have a, here a picture of uh, one of our uh, first conferences with Dr. Matthias Arauz. We track vaccination progress in all countries where we operate. We register, we measure our vaccination, all related events. 
So our ambition in Diaverno is that vaccines for us, they are the key to for the way out of the pandemic. We want to contribute to protect, protect our kidney patients and our staff. In all our clinics, we are prepared to support patients, their families and caregivers with any questions that they have. We want that all, all patients and staff with no contraindication take the vaccine when available. Let me reinforce with very simple take home message that we do believe vaccines are safe. Vaccines are effective, so they can save lives. The benefits of vaccination greatly outweigh the risks of getting this serious disease, COVID-19. Thank you, Michaela. Back to you. I will stop share my screen. Thank you, Dr. Macario, for a very comprehensive presentation on kidney disease and the COVID-19 vaccine. I am sure that our participants have received a lot of useful information. And we have some, some uh, questions from the audience. So I thought I would, would uh, start with one of them uh, being, after getting the vaccine, how long does it take to build antibodies? That's a very good question. It will, it will not be the same in every single person. We know that after the first dose, many patients already start to build antibodies at 10 days, but the full immune response will be after the second dose in those vac vaccines that we are using more now that have two doses. And we also know that eventually this can be a little bit different in renal patients as they have a different immune system so it can take a bit, a, lo a bit longer for them to, to achieve the antibodies. And that's why we think it is extremely important to maintain the protective measures. Let me also say that the, the, the immune response is not only with antibodies. So even with lower titles, some patients that can be also protected with different types of, of uh, immunity, like, uh, as I said during the presentation, the cellular immunity. So my advice to the patient is that even if they start to have antibodies uh, after the first dose, they have to wait after the second dose, at least around 10 days, to consider themselves protected uh, uh, and when we say protected, so far we say protected, protected of severe disease. So measures in place because they can still eventually carry the virus. And we are starting to see this a little bit because it's important to say that we vaccinated already 35% of our patients with at least one dose. Uh, worldwide, in some countries, 95% of our patients. And what we don't see now is as much severe cases and mortality went down a lot. Let me say, say that in one country that we could vaccinate 95% of our patients and almost all, all, all our staff, we don't have a single case for 10 days now. So vaccine is the key for this, but continue the protective measures. That's really positive news. And we have another question from the audience. Uh, are there contradictions to applying the flu and the COVID vaccines? And should we vaccinate kidney patients with both vaccines or should we prioritize the COVID vaccination? Our, uh, we, should, we should vaccinate patients with both vaccines, but not at the same time. So this is a rule for, uh, for all vaccines, that there should be 
at least at weeks different between the, the administration of vaccines, not at the same times, but we will keep our programs of vaccination for influenza, but different times, and also for pneumococcal disease. So the fact that the patient is vaccinated for influence does not confer protection for COVID, and it's also the other way around. And let's not forget that the flu can be also a serious disease, especially in, in uh, these kind of populations. So what we do is we differ the, the timing of vaccination on this. Great. And we are also receiving a lot of questions around of those different vaccines types that you have, have just presented to us. Uh, which would be the most recommended one for, for kidney patients? Is there any recommended um, uh, distributor of, of the vaccine? Well, in a, in a practical way, uh, I would say that, first of all, first, first advice, vaccinate as soon as possible, no matter what the vaccine. But of course, there are different between the, the vaccines. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that kidney patients on dialysis and transplanted patients especially, they have a different immune system. So the response can eventually not be the same. And we know that the from the trial publications, the, the both genetic vaccines, the one from Pfizer, the one from Moderna, also the, the Sputnik vaccine shown a very high efficacy preventing symptomatic and severe COVID-19 disease. We still don't know what will be the duration of the of the of the protection, so we, we still have a lot to, to learn. But so far, with the data that we have, we cannot say that one vaccine offers advantage compared with other vaccine. So I would not delay my vaccination waiting for a specific one. All vaccines confer protection, some a little bit more than others, but I will go for any vaccine. And let me also say that these vaccines, they, are, they don't have live virus. So they are not a risk even for immunocompromised patients, even for transplanted patients. Right, that actually answered one of the other questions. So key is to get vaccinated as soon as you can, no matter what vaccine you're offered then. Uh, I have another question that steers away a little bit from, from the vaccination, but more towards COVID and, uh, and, and kidneys. How does COVID-19 affect the kidneys? Well, that's a very interesting question. That's a very interesting question. We have to look, look this in, 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 in several aspects. The first one is regarding COVID itself, the disease. That has a, is a serious disease, as you all know. And it can lead, in serious cases, it, it, it can lead to many complications. And one of those complications is a good kidney injury even with the need for dialysis. We saw that especially in, uh, in ICU patients, and there are very good statistical and very good, uh, very good publications on that, that the, the kidney complications, the good kidney injury is one of the more serious complications in COVID-19 patients. This is one side of the disease. The other is, of course, that we know that the chronic kidney patients, especially if they have advanced disease. As I said, they have a higher risk of a worse uh, prognosis with COVID-19. And if they have already kidney disease, even if not advanced disease, 
but in earlier stages of chronic kidney disease, like uh, for instance, stage three or stage four, so not needing dialysis, if they are affected with severe COVID, the disease can progress on that and return to the previous uh, renal function, eventually in some cases will not be complete. We see that this in other cases of uh, kidney, uh, acute kidney injury. Injury. So there are two sides. One is the risk of having severe disease for chronic patients that uh, we spoke, I spoke about during the presentation. The other one is COVID-19 can have different types of complications, like the most common known is the pneumonia, but also vascular complications, cardiovascular complications, and acute kidney injury. It's one of the, 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 the more important complications, and it can, it, it can also uh, worsen the prognosis of uh, an ICU patient, a patient that is in an in intensive care unit with COVID-19. So very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, many good questions today. Um, and then we also have um, if there is any evidence of mixing different vaccines from different companies, is that something that you can answer? Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you that we still don't have the evidence on that, but there are studies going on on this. Uh, one that I looked is the one that uh, started February clinical trial between the Russian Gamaleya Institute, the Sputnik, and the AstraZeneca. They are exactly see, trying to see this. It's one of the, so we will have answers. And there is another very interesting point. That is, if one patient does not respond to the vaccine, imagine a, a transplant patient that we suspect that they have a lesser response to the vaccine than a patient with a normal immune system. If they don't respond, we have two options. One is to give him a post with the same vaccine, but there are now people de defending and studying this, that another option can be to give, them, give him a different type of vaccine developed with a different platform to try to see if he will respond to that. So, the answer is there is no evidence, but there is some common sense that eventually we will go into that direction. And it is already going on a study between those two companies that I asked uh, exactly on this. Great. And then we have a question from somebody who jumped in a little bit late and, and asks if I'm vaccinated, uh, can I still spread the virus to other people? Yeah, we don't have a clear answer on, on that, but eventually it, it can. So what we know now is that vaccine protects from severe disease, uh, but we are not sure that, he, he, and I spoke of that during the presentation, we are not sure that a vaccinated uh, person cannot spread disease. Probably it can carry the virus eventually, even not having any symptoms or not having the disease. So that's why, until now, we recommend to keep the measures in place. But of course, we start vaccination in December. It's only three months until now, or less than three months. So there have been many open questions. This is one of the important questions. It looks like eventually people that get vaccine could transmit the, the virus, even not having the disease. So we must be absolutely careful on, on this. So keeping measures in place then. Yeah, we say um, that ever, ever, ever again. I keep repeating this. And of course, we will have different types of vaccine because there are many vaccines on pipeline. Uh, and things eventually will be different in the future. And let's not, let's not forget one thing. We still miss also one aspect to combat this disease. It would be extremely good to have 
a treatment, a therapeutic that could cure the disease like we have now, for instance, in hepatitis C or even in HIV that we can keep the disease. Um, so we need therapeutics also to, to, to completely fight this. So keep measures, point number one. Have a strong response from uh, health institutions to try to have a therapeutics for the disease, for those that will still contract the disease, because this even vaccine is not 100% uh, efficacy. And of course, vaccinate uh, more and more and more people. Great, so we have one last question uh, and I'm gonna read it from, from one of the submitters. My mother is 80 years old. She had COVID in late March with no symptoms. She doesn't have any other serious diseases and took the Pfizer vaccine. The first shot was given to her in January and the second shot in February. And after 15 days, they made her do a PCR test. And, uh, and, it, the, the, and it's positive to COVID and again in quarantine with no symptoms. How is it possible to be positive again after taking the vaccine? Yeah, there are several, several possible answers for this. First of all, this is an important point. She, she had COVID March last year. So eventually she could lose the, the protection. Eventually she could uh, contract another variant. And we also, and there is another the question. One is exactly what I was being, was what I said before, that we don't know if the vaccine avoids that people can contract the, the virus. And for what I understood, she is asymptomatic. So it can be one of these cases. She has no disease and that's what we want, but she can carry the virus. The other possibility, is that vaccination is not 100% uh, efficacy. It's 70, 75, 80, 95, even if it is 95, 5% will not be protected. It can be one of these cases. And also our immune system is like, like everything in our body. It gets old. We get old. Our immune system gets old also. And eventually, some older people cannot respond the same way as younger people with a strong immune response. But the positive on, on this is that she has no disease. But this goes also on what we are saying. But she can spread this disease to someone if she has, has the virus. So, all protective measures must be in place and also isolation and so on and the testing of contacts. So this goes exactly on what we said. It's not 100% protection and probably it is protection about disease. We still don't know if it will avoid people to carry the virus, probably not. Excellent. So time flies a lot when you're having fun, and I am afraid we need to wrap it up. So back to you, Kirsty. Thanks very much, uh, Michaela. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Macario, for sharing your knowledge. Michaela, for facilitating the questions. And a huge thank you to our audience for sticking with us, listening to the presentation, and also sharing your questions. Some really pertinent ones that I think many of us will be pondering. Um, I know I'm in a very uh, lucky position. I'm in the UK and I've been asked for my vaccine to go to my vaccine on a Tuesday. So I'm going to be going for that um, because as Dr. Macario says, it's the safest thing we can do. So as mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, um, Diavarum is also organizing a series of webinars coming up. And we have a particular one next that will be on health literacy, which everybody here will be invited to. And this will take place in late May. So look out for information on that. Thank you all for joining us for today's session. We really appreciate the engaged participation. 
And you can find out more in information on our approach to COVID-19 and vaccination on our Diavarum website. With that, we finished the webinar and thank you very much for your attention. Good night.